our restoration or it restored our communion with God. It restored our communion with God. Sin was dealt with, with the substitution. And the result was that the sins of the people were covered and they were restored to a position of, to, with God that they could be blessed by God once again. Now there's a phrase in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 that says this, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Folks, listen, blood had to be shed. Blood had to be shed. And listen, there are people that, that you come in contact with who say, well, that Levitical Old Testament, Levitical high priest system doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm not a Jew. doesn't have anything to do with me. Listen, it has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with us. Because that is the foreshadow of what was going to be done through Christ. Now, let me, before we go on, let me give this to you. The work of the high priest in the Old Testament, we've already seen, is a foreshadow of the work that Jesus Christ is going to do. It's the exact same work. And so the principles of the Old Testament, the limits of the sacrifice of the Old Testament, would you agree with me if I said, are the same limits that are carried over to the sacrifice of Christ in the New Testament? True? Let me ask you a question. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and he transferred sin onto that animal and then sacrificed that animal on the burnt altar and then sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. That appeased the sins of who? Of God of for who? That appeased God's wrath for who? Israel. Let me ask you a question, class. Did that help the Canaanites? What about the Babylonians? But the Philistines, the Hivites, the Pezzarites, the Jebusites, did it help any of those people? Listen, the atonement of the Old Testament was, for a, was intended for a specific people. And who were those people? Israel. It did not help anyone outside of Israel. And you even see that back in Exodus, don't you? The night that God came through, and I don't believe it was a death angel. I believe it was God. I believe it was a Christophany. I believe it was a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus Christ when he came through the, the nation of Egypt and he killed all the firstborn of everyone in the Egyptian's home. They were never warned. They were warned of every plague but that one. The Egyptians didn't know what was hitting them, but the Israelites did. They were the ones warned to apply the blood. Not the Egyptians. And when the, and when the high priest in the Old Testament sacrificial system went into the Holy of Holies and made sacrifice for sin to appease God, it was for the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel only. Did not help any other nation. Now if, as Hebrew says, the system of the Old Testament is the same as the system of the New Testament, then what does that tell us? The sacrifice of Christ is for a specific number of people. And it does not help those people that are outside of that number. You say, Pastor, who are those numbers? Verse 2, all that as many as thou was given me. And we don't know who they are. We just know the language of the Bible. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? Hebrews says, those who are being sacrificed. Yes. Yes. Exactly right. And the New Testament teaches us, folks, that it was by blood. It was by death. John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Romans chapter 3 and verse 5. Whom God displayed publicly as, a, here's that word again, propitiation in his blood through faith. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Who gave himself for 
our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. But now in Jesus Christ, you who formerly were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. And not through the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the what? Precious blood of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And there are a whole bunch of other passages that we could give you. But you get the idea that Jesus Christ was an actual substitution. He actually bore sin. He actually bore guilt. And He was actually punished for our substitute. Now it's very vital that you remember this. Because as we go on in the weeks coming in chapter 17, we are building on this. And what we're doing is we are laying the groundwork, if you will, and we're, and we're bringing up an argument for actual atonement. And we're proving by the Scriptures that the language of the New Testament does not dictate a general atonement, but dictates a particular atonement, right? And we're making that argument based on the language of the Word of God. And the first word that you need to understand and remember is the word substitution. Substitution. Jesus Christ was our substitute. He took our place. That's why we sing, Jesus paid it all. Right? There are some churches that they have to sing, Jesus paid a part. Hopefully I'll bring the rest. There are some churches that have to sing that way because Jesus didn't do it all because they have to exercise their free will in order to make it applicable Jesus paid it all all to him I owe right Jesus paid it all and that's why I asked you a couple weeks ago I think it was was it an actual atonement or was it a potential atonement did Jesus Christ actually substitute for people did he actually do that when he said at the cross of Calvary it is finished was it actually finished or was it just started Did he actually make a substitution? Well, the Bible is clear that he made, that he was an actual substitution. Not only in the verses that we gave you that I hope you wrote down, but as you look back in the Levitical high priest system, and Hebrew says that that's the job that the high priest did was the same job that Jesus Christ was doing. And we have seen in just a very short brief time this evening, the intent of the atonement was to wipe out, was to completely annihilate sin for his people. And if the guilt is wiped out by the blood of Christ, then it is gone. It is gone. And we'll add more to that foundation as the weeks go on. And why I, again, why I talk about the atonement here is because the atonement is seen all throughout chapter 17. And as this prayer was for a special people, okay, was this prayer for a general prayer for the whole world, or was this prayer for a special people? What does verse 9 say? I ask, Jesus is the words of Jesus, praying back to the Father, verse 9, I ask on their behalf, I am not praying for the world. But I am praying for those that you have given me out of the world, for they are yours. Who belongs to the, according to the words of Christ, who belongs to the Father? The ones that God gave. 
The ones that God gave. When did God give? Did God give to the Son the moment I received Christ? Was that when the giving took place? No, according to Romans 8, according to Ephesians 1, according to 1 Peter 3, according to 1 Timothy 2, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, the giving took place in eternity past. According to John 6, according to Romans 9, the giving took place before anything was created. Will you forgive me tonight if I tell you that it was a super lapsarian atonement? Go back and look at your notes to get that definition. I'm not going to tell you again. <laughs> we, did we go over that or didn't we go? You go, go to the church video site and you can, and you can, you can watch the video and, and get the silly uh, descriptions again. It was just as this prayer in John 17 were for a special people. The atonement of Jesus Christ was for a special people. Now with that said, we've looked at some things last week. We looked at the atonement's people. I took you back to verse 2. We, we talked about the fact of who the actual atonement was for. And then we started talking about the atonement's product in the first part of verse 3. It said, Jesus said, this is life eternal. And then we stopped there. Now I want you to point number 3. Now, just a brief disclaimer here, if I might. A brief disclaimer. I have changed my perspective on something, uh, on this verse, on verse 3, since my studies a couple of weeks ago. Now, when I tell you that I've changed my perspective, that doesn't mean that I'm fickle and easily swayed from what I believe. By the grace of Almighty God, I am strong in the convictions that I hold dear by the Word of God. And I have not swerved one iota from the convictions that I hold dear that I see is from the pages of Holy Scripture. But the change that came in my perspective on verse 3 came or has come from a clear reading of the biblical text. And I want you to notice the reading of this very carefully, very clearly, very carefully with me. What does Jesus say in verse 3? And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, Jesus has already said, you have given me the authority. You have given me the power that I may command. And we saw that the word authority had to do with the command. You have given me the power. You have given me the authority to command eternal life to everyone everybody that you have given me. And then he goes on in verse 3, follow with me in the text, and then he goes on in verse 3 and begins to explain eternal life. This is life eternal, okay? I have been given the authority to command. Now I want to explain to you what it is. Now you say, well, Jesus is praying to the Father. He wouldn't have needed to explain to the Father what eternal life is, and you're absolutely right. But he's not explaining to the Father what eternal life is. He's explaining it to the disciples who are no doubt listening to him pray. Let me ask you a question. When you've been talking with someone about the Bible or about salvation or some type of deep theological thing, have you ever been speaking with someone else face to face but hoping this guy over here is listening to every word you're saying? That's what Jesus is doing when he's praying. He's praying directly to the Father, but he's praying within hearing range of the 11 disciples now that are walking along the road to the garden with him. So he's not explaining it to God. He's explaining it to the disciples, okay? This is eternal life. And folks, I kept on and kept on. I was, you know, I even took my, I was sitting in my study and I was reading that verse, Nathan. And I, I was reading it and I was reading it and I was reading it in the Greek. I was reading, you know. I, and then I, the longer I read it, the more frustrated I got because I, I said to myself, this doesn't fit. This doesn't fit my outline. Like that old preacher said, I've got a wonderful sermon if I can just find a Bible passage to match it. Right? The God, this doesn't fit my outline. This, these things can't be. And you know what caught my, you know what the big blue, you know what the hang up was? This is silly. But you know what the hang up was? A crazy conjunction. 
One little conjunction, verse 3, the word 